our New Testament lesson today. We read from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through His Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, and the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him, who by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the Word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. Let's once more go to God in prayer for the preaching of the word. Almighty, all-knowing, and ever-present God, by your goodness and grace, we approach this divine appointment for the proclamation of your living word that so faithfully speaks to our condition. Grant our ears to listen carefully to the voice of your Holy Spirit, Grant our eyes to see your kingdom at hand and fill our hearts with courage to respond in joyful and faithful obedience. We pray all this in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm currently preaching a sermon series called Spirit-Filled Living. We are in Ephesians, and I'll be preaching from Ephesians for the next several weeks through, through August. The whole point of a lot of what Paul is saying in Ephesians uh, is teaching on the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. Uh, liturgically, we are in what's called the season after Pentecost. And it's this, this long season that reminds us of who God calls us to be as the church. So at Pentecost, we, we call Pentecost the birthday of the church. Uh, it is uh, the, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on all flesh on Pentecost. And after Pentecost, the church movement uh, exploded. And it began to uh, spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the salvation of Jesus. And God calls us and fills us with the Holy Spirit. And the same Holy Spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost is the same Holy Spirit that continues to move and flow in the life of the church and in us who, by faith, believe in Jesus. So what is the Holy Spirit? And what does the Holy Spirit mean in our lives? Well, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have learned so far through, through the last few weeks that by the Holy Spirit, we are marked as God's children and given a deposit of an inheritance of eternal life. See, we, we first learned that God marks us that we have the seal of, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work in our lives to remind us that we are children of God and we are heirs to a promise. And the promise that we have inherited is the promise of eternal life. And then we see also that the reconciling work of God's salvation removes the barriers of division between God and our neighbor by the same Holy Spirit. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, we, we see how the Holy Spirit is at work in, in reconciling all things uh, according to, to God's will and to bring us back in relationship by removing the barriers that, that separate us. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And in today's scripture, we see that through the Holy Spirit, we are filled with power. What's the most powerful thing you've ever witnessed? Think about it for a moment. What's the most powerful thing that comes to your mind? In my recent memory, just this last week, maybe you saw uh, the historic launch of Blue Origin that launched into space, bringing in a new era of what could be commercial space flight. Can you imagine? I have told Katie that 
you know, by the time we reach our 50th anniversary, by then, my hope is that we'll be able to celebrate our anniversary on the moon. I already love her to the moon and back, so wouldn't that be something? I'll be 77. I won't tell you how old Katie will be, but I'll be 77. Who knows? Who knows? By then, we might be able to do that. What an amazing thought to think of. But if you saw any of the coverage of it, you undoubtedly heard the reporters describe the, the power and the, the awe of, of witnessing something like a space rocket take off. Apparently, I mean, I cannot imagine how, you know, I'm sure TV just does not, doesn't do it justice. What it might feel like to, to be able to, to be close enough to, to hear the roar and to feel the, the heat and the, to hear the, the sound of this powerful rocket taking off. I looked it up and apparently it, in order for a rocket to, to be launched, it has to produce 7.2 million pounds of thrust. Can you imagine 7.2 million pounds of thrust to escape uh, the, the velocity of, of Earth and to escape the, the gravitational pull? And it, if you watch the, the takeoff, you, you saw the speedometer keep going up and up and up. That thing reached over 2,000 miles per hour. Can you imagine traveling 2,000 miles per hour straight up? Another powerful thing that comes to my mind is a bolt of lightning. You know, that may be something that may be a little more common if you've ever seen a bolt of lightning. Apparently a bolt of lightning contains one billion joules of, of energy. That's enough energy to power an open fridge for a month or a 60 watt light bulb for six months or a small town of 56 homes for an entire day. It's a lot of power in, in one, one bulb. The, the context of the scripture day is a prayer. It's an intercessory prayer that Paul is praying for, for the church. And his prayer is that they might be filled with, with power. Now get this. The word in the Greek language for power is the word dynamis. Does that sound familiar? It's where we get the word. It was used to inspire the, whenever, whenever Alfred Nobel invented a substance in 1867. He first called it uh, Nobel's safety powder. But that didn't have the right kind of ring to it. So he was inspired by this Greek word and named it what we know as dynamite. Dynamite. You know, whenever you use dynamite, it, it leaves a lasting impression, right? It transforms something in a way that can never uh, be, be done again, right? It's, it, it changes something that is, that is permanent. The definition of, of this word in the Greek, it means to be able to produce a strong effect. And what we see, Paul use, uses this word four times in this chapter. In verse 7, Paul says, Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of His power. And in the scripture that was read today in in verse 16, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. In verse 18, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend what is the breadth and length and width and depth to know the love of Christ. And then in verse 20, now to him who by the power at work within us. So this power is pretty important to Paul. And it. If the kind of power that Paul is describing was inspired to name something like dynamite, then this power must indeed have a strong effect. An explosion of dynamite transforms whatever it touches so that it will never be the same. The power of God in us, church, transforms us from the inside out so that we are never the same whenever we encounter the power of God's grace. Do you know that power? Is that power living in you today? When was the last time you, you felt that power of God move you uh, in, in the Holy Spirit? My prayer is that we might know that power at work within us and within the church. 
First, through the Holy Spirit, Christ dwells in our hearts. One commentator put it this way, saying that the ministry of the Spirit is devoted to making the presence and power of the risen Christ real. Real to those He indwells. See, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to make the the power that rose Jesus from the dead real and alive in us. See, that same resurrection power that, that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us when, when we know Christ. Church, there's nothing more powerful than that. See, God is continuing in our lives to call, to call us out of death and into life. And I want to tell you this morning that no matter what your situation in life may be, whatever situation you walked into church this morning that may tell you that you are defeated, I want you to hear today the power of the gospel to know that God's will in your life is to find victory in in your life. And the power of God can overcome any any trial that you may be facing in life today. Why? Because Christ lives in you, the hope of glory. Secondly, through the Holy Spirit, we are rooted and grounded in love. I love the language that Paul uses here, rooted and and grounded. These are agricultural terms. He's describing what it means to, to be nourished and established. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. The, the Holy Spirit is at work to, to nourish our souls, to, to nourish us in, what does the Scripture say, the love of Christ. To nourish us, to remind us that, that we are loved and we are called to, to the way of, of, of love. Note the, word, note the phrase, as you are being. That's an important phrase. That means that the work is not done yet. Can I get an amen that none of us here, that God is w- done working on us? God is never done working on us, church. And we are continually, thanks be to God, growing. And we are continually being rooted and grounded day by day. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 4.16, that the inner nature uh, is being renewed day by day. Day by day. It's a daily process. So don't get discouraged if you have a bad day or an off day. Know that the Holy Spirit is able to overcome us uh, even at our worst. And lastly, the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, we gain understanding of God's perspective. Paul describes that we might know the breadth and length and the height and depth. That's four-dimensional reality. That means in every direction. I guess because of the uh, space flight this week, I I have been considering and pondering the universe. Have you ever just sat and pondered how big the universe is, how amazing it is? You know, it's something that I think is a part of all of our curiosity to wonder what, what's out there and how, how far does it go. And, and scientists tell us that, that, there's no, that there's no end to the universe. It, it's continuing to expand. And as, as Christians, we, we, part of our faith formation and is understanding that God is the creator of, of all of this. And to, to think and, and imagine to behold the wonder of God's creation in, in all the cosmos. To think how far, uh, how far everything stretches out in, in all of the stars and planets and solar systems and, and how powerful all of those, those things and how powerful God must be. Think about that for a moment. The God who created all that is the same God that lives in us. And not only does creation expand outwardly, so there's, there's what's called... Uh, macro, the big picture, the un- a macro universe, but when you consider the, the micro universe, it's amazing. It, it seems to go on the other direction in infinity. It, if, if you take uh, a piece of grass and, and, and put it under a microscope and you begin to see the cells and then you begin to see how those cells are formed, it is amazing to consider God's creation. Now, when you consider that, consider how much God loves you. The creator that made all of that knows you by name, counts the hairs on your head. The same God that created all of that created you. 
and dwells and desires to, to live inside of you. Another thing that Paul stresses here in the doxology. Now to him who by the power at work within us. I want to stress that word us there. That word us. That's also important. Because you see, we are not called to this Christian life on our own. The Holy Spirit is at work, yes, in our personal lives. But when you study the New Testament and you study the work of the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit is to equip the church. And it is, it is the church that is the body of Christ now. And it is the Holy Spirit at work in the church. We need the church. We, we need each other. So I want to encourage us today to lean in to that power at work within us, not only in our individual lives, but in our life together as, as a church. To know that that power is at work within us. In just a moment, we're going to sing our closing hymn, I Am Thine, O Lord. And as we sing this, the invitation today is to let this hymn be, be the prayer of your heart and to consider the power of God's love living in you. There's a line that goes, there are depths of love and heights of joy. Depths of love and heights of joy. I think the hymn writer must have had this scripture in mind that we might know the, the height and depth of, of, of God's love. Now, the, the hymn writer uh, puts it, until we, until we have peace, until we lay at peace with him, but I, I think Scripture makes it very clear that this power is not something that's just waiting for us on the other side of death. But that power and that knowledge that God desires is something that is beginning to work in us now. So as we sing this closing hymn, I want to encourage us all to draw near to God, to give our lives to God, and trust that the Holy Spirit is at work to, to raise us in this power uh, in, in the Holy Spirit. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.